Hey guys, welcome back, it's Ripe again in today's video. A racist employee pulled a taser on me and attacked me and did not realize that I am the owner of the business. Let's dive right into the story. The title story starts like this. This is a story about an employee I hired. For context, here in the Czech Republic I own a chain of small bars around Prague and other closed cities. Because of this, I don't have the time to manage each bar myself, instead I hire managers that report back to me daily on things I should know. I let my managers run things their way, so as long as the job gets done right, I am happy, this includes hiring their own staff. Ordinarily, this would not be a problem. In my 8 years of business, I could count the times I've had a serious incident, such as firing an employee, with only the fingers on one hand. I guess I just got unlucky this time. It all started the night of my friend's birthday. We had decided to throw a surprise party and where better to start the festivities than my own bar. I got there early and after smoothing over things with the day manager, I left to get changed while the bar staff added a few final touches. This was before the shift changes so there had not been any problems yet. After freshening up I left my apartment to pick up my friends, arriving at the bar a little after 7. The streets were dark but the string of festive lights around my bar glistened like beacons of hope, inviting in the hungry travelers. Inside a small corner of the second floor had been cordoned off into a temporary VIP area with tables pushed together to form a cozy booth. Without hesitation, we made our way upstairs and started on the champagne that was left for us. It didn't take long of course until the bottle ran dry, with my friends deep in conversation I excused myself to order the next round of drinks. At this point the floor had begun to get quite busy, with a few tables occupied and a small group of youngsters in the corner dancing to the latest musical trend jamming over the loudspeakers. Alcohol seemed to have that effect on people quite often, after one of our fruity cocktails even the tensest wallflower bloomed into a dance machine by the night's end. But anyway, yes the drinks. As I approached the bar, I realized that I did not recognize the lady working tonight. I was happy that I could use the opportunity to also make introductions. I like to be on good terms with everyone I worked with, even if I was not their direct supervisor. I waved her over and while I was initially sure she caught my attempt, her eyes gazed over the room before turning away and serving someone else. I shrugged it off as a misunderstanding, maybe she was nervous because she was new, right? When I caught her attention again, a whole 10 minutes later I knew that something was off. She looked seriously pissed, even though she had been smiling at customers just moments ago. Deciding not to make an issue of it yet, I asked for a few beers to take upstairs to which her eyes scanned me head to toe as if appraising my value. She then flatly said no, not elaborating further before she moved away to serve someone else. This time I followed her path and confronted her, asking again for my order. My friends must have heard the growing commotion as they called to me from the balcony above watching the incident unfold with the employee. Turning back to me with venom she explained that disgusting sick Asians were not welcome in her bar prompting us towards the exit with a jerk of her head. The other customers quietly shuffled away to get away from the drama unfolding. Barely keeping a hold of my stress and temper I calmly explained that she couldn't refuse us, she ignored my attempts at diplomacy and this time shouted for us to leave. When I told her I wouldn't, she raised her voice again, digging into her pockets and pulling out a small black device that crackled with electricity. She ordered us to leave again, saying that she would taste each filthy Asian if we didn't. Before I could respond, she lunged at me over the bar and tried to jab me with the taser. I stumbled back and fell over a stool, but at least I missed the worst of it. The taser fell and clattered to the floor out of her grasp. Fear turned to anger as my friends came down the stairs to join the protest. As she realized her threats of violence and intimidation had failed, she left and called out for security. Optimistically, I waited so that I could explain my identity and authority, but before I could say a word, a group of burly individuals had grabbed and hurled us out into the street. I was kicked out of my own bar. Never before had I been so ashamed and angry. If this employee could use her authority against me in this way, how many others had she already hurt with her behavior before now? 
And if I did not meet her today, how much longer would her evil ways fly under the radar here, tainting the name of my brand and driving off customers? I rang ahead the next morning to make sure she was working today and then over to the police requesting them to meet me at the bar to investigate a crime. My friend had secretly filmed the whole thing from their phone, giving me the perfect chance and evidence to hold against her. I let the cops inside the premises and we found her in the staff room, sipping on a coffee with the day manager. I ordered them both to sit down and explain themselves, then I saw it, I had finally clicked in her head that she was in trouble. After explaining the events of the night to the manager to her, the cops, despite her occasional protests, I think I made my case quite clear. When she began to lie and say I exaggerated the situation, pointing at my own aggressiveness, I revealed my ace. The cops were delighted at the video evidence while she became pale and quiet. With great pleasure, I fired her and pressed charges, sending her to be processed at the nearest police station. I decided to be merciful and let my manager off with a warning. The sword now dangling very loosely over his head also. Two weeks later, through a very cut and dry court case, she was found undeniably guilty and got several years behind bars. These days, I still try to stay out of the way, but occasionally you may find me attending an employee interview just to know who I may be dealing with later. And the next one is a malicious compliance story. So this happened on my bachelor's party about three years back. I took my guys on a week-long canoe camping trip. My father volunteered to haul all our canoes behind his new Ford Expat Explorer slash Canyonero. He even got a canoe trailer for the event. Before leaving, we checked the local laws of the destination. The destination had a law that anything towed cannot be four foot past the rearmost support, strut, frame, etc. without displaying a red marker, aka flag. Before leaving, my father made absolutely sure that all the canoes were within that 4 foot mark, one coming literally right within 0.25 inches. Then, in an additional show of safety, he tied a nice red bandana on the back of the longest canoe, which happened to have a metal bow and loop for tie down and anchoring, which was perfect to tie the flag on. This is the compliance part, not malicious in intent, but will come to be in consequence. So the camping trip went well. On the way back, my mom was following behind the Canyonero in her own sedan, carrying extra groomsmen from the trip. My parents volunteered to drive them back after their car broke down on the way up. In a day-long drive home, we hit a semi-major city, touristy area, in rush hour. As we are driving on the main route, crossing an intersection, an impatient jeep driver cuts in between my mom and dad, pulling between the Canyonero with a canoe trailer and my mom's car with no room to spare. Traffic suddenly stopped and my dad had to slow down to a stop quickly. The jeep drove straight into the canoe trailer. Now, the longest canoe was upside down on the trailer and had that metal bow. The jeep was an SUV and she drove into one lower canoe with her bumper and into slash under the longer canoe with her hood. We felt the bump in the canyon arrow and then another bump and she backed up and out from under the canoes. Her bumper impaled on a lower canoe and her hood drove under the metal bow of the upper canoe. When she reversed, she effectively peeled her hood like a tin can opener. My dad and the female driver of the jeep got out of their SUVs. She was a mid-50s woman from Jersey with the let me see your manager haircut and she was in a rush to get home immediately. She commented how she owned a vacation home in the area and how he damaged her brand new jeep before citing local laws and said that he needed a red flag which he didn't have. It had blown off on the many hour highway trip. My father commented that he's carrying many big red canoes home and she was such an impatient driver that she cut off my mom who was following him before plowing into the big red canoes. The jeep lady commented that it was probably a scheme for both my mom and dad to try and trick people into getting between them before stopping and forcing others to hit them for the insurance money. She threatened to sue him for damages to her SUV in addition to distress and one or two other things I couldn't remember. She demanded the police come immediately to her aid to note the details for her up and coming lawsuit. I already called them, my dad confidently said as he had immediately called them after being rear-ended before getting out of the car. Good, she said smugly. Just then a police cruiser pulled up and had to block rush hour traffic. A mid 20 something cop got out and Jeep Lady immediately was all over him to harass him about this alleged entrapment scheme, supposedly forcing her to drive into a trailer with giant red canoes. She quotes the local law and forces the officer to get out a tape measure to check for the four foot rule. The police officer, obviously annoyed at this woman who rear ended a trailer and then is claiming to be the victim, says that my father is within curfew. 
coat. She said, no he's not, measure again. He does so, he calls her over to show that the canoe is indeed just within the forefoot rule and indeed does not require a red marker flag. She says, well, check his brake lights. I couldn't see any. The officer quotes a local law saying that the brake lights must be visible at standing height at a certain distance. He then proceeds to use the measuring tape again. She forced him to bring out to measure that exact distance, stood there and told my dad to go hit his brake pedal. My father does so and both trailer brake lights engage. The officer comments, he is legal. The woman then berates him that he's wrong and says, well, I couldn't see those tail lights. I was much closer than that. The officer smirked and said, do you think that may have been the problem, ma'am? Long story short, he wrote the police report to state how my father was within every inch of the local laws and that not only did this woman rear end him, but that she must have been extraordinarily inept to rear end a trailer full of giant 18 foot red canoes. My father ended up being awarded the cost of two new canoes and a new trailer from her insurance agency who found her 100% at fault. The next one is titled Job Petty Revenge. So I'm a seamstress and before getting this job I did freelance sewing jobs for extra cash and to maintain my skills. Since I've been hired I'm not allowed to sidekick services offered by the shop and I would be immediately fired if my boss found out. This is my dream job and I will not under any circumstances jeopardize this opportunity. So a good friend called me to ask if I could help her son, a grown man, with an alteration that I do a ton of at work. Said that he needed a new zipper on his jacket. I explained that I'm not freelancing from my living room anymore and to have him come by the store for an estimate and we would get him sorted out. He comes in and is told word for word by my boss, like we discussed the other day, this would be $35 plus 5 to 8 for the new zipper. The jacket in question is actually a Carhartt winter work coat and replacing that zipper is not the same 20 minute task as turning a pullover hoodie into a zip up. Also, even if I was still doing sewing jobs from home, I don't have an industrial machine capable of making that job easy and I would have charged him at least $50, so $35 is an extremely reasonable price. Well, I didn't know that he had already been in a few days before and been told the same price, which is apparently when he got mad and called his mom to ask if I could do it for him. When he heard the price was not changing just because I'm friends with his mom, he started in with $35 for a zipper is outrageous. My mom could do it so much cheaper. I cannot believe you would charge that much just for a zipper. Blah 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 and other general rudeness. Side note, his mom did not know it was a Carhartt, does not even own a sewing machine and would have to do it by hand and he would have to mail it to her in a different state. So he storms out and everyone just looks at me and says, well that was embarrassing. And we all get back to work but I am seething. How dare he come into my job and shows his ass like that after having his mom call me as favor. Hell no. So I called his mother back and explained exactly what he had been told and how he acted towards us. She said he told her that they had quoted him $60 for the new zipper so now he has been caught lying as well. She said he will definitely be hearing from me about this. I did not raise him to be such a butthole and that behavior is unacceptably rude. Don't even worry about him, I'm gonna handle it. I've known them for years so I know he is not escaping that come to Jesus conversation. So I hope he enjoys getting royally chewed out by his parents and still not having a functioning zipper. I'm looking forward to when he inevitably comes crawling back to apologize after he finds out his mom won't be hand sewing that zipper for him and the one or two other places around that do alterations charge a fair bit more than we do. And now the next one is an am I the a-hole story. It starts like this. So I, 28 male, was married to my ex-wife for two years before we divorced because I realized I was gay. I had been out as bi from age 16 as I knew I liked men but I also liked women however I realized when I was 24 that I didn't like women at all. So I told my wife I wanted a divorce but said I was happy to co-parent our one year old and she agreed. At that time we both lived in London until recently I moved to Switzerland to live with my now husband and we got married there. I did not invite my ex as she had a new boyfriend who me and our little boy don't like and I knew he would definitely say something homophobic at the wedding. I have complete custody of our son as he wanted to live with me and my ex agreed. Now our son was at the wedding and looked so smart so I sent photos to my ex and she started messaging me and calling me telling me that I'm so rude for not inviting her or even telling her 
and she did want our son back with her. I said no and now all her family are messaging me saying I'm an a-hole and should have told her. I don't know if I am or not. Note, the agreement about custody was in court and she knew at that time that I had a fiancé so I don't know what she was expecting to happen in the future. And here ripe stars let me know in the comments what you think about this. Is OP the a-hole here or not? Anyway, comment number one, not the a-hole since she already knew you had a fiancé, congrats on the wedding while you were under no obligation to invite her, you could have mentioned that the wedding was happening. However, from her reaction she probably would have tried to crash it and cause a scene. Comment number two, you're the a-hole, you didn't have to invite her and I don't agree with that part of her reaction, but you should absolutely have told the mother of your kid that her child now has a stepdad. That is a pretty big thing to not mention. Comment number three, you're the a-hole, not telling your ex about a, your wedding and then sending her pictures of it seems like an obvious dick move to me. You didn't need to invite her for obvious reasons, but at least let her know, because when co-parenting your situation is important to her too. Update to the story, I'm editing the post now to give some more info that some people might have needed. My son is 5 currently and he was 1 when we divorced. My son visits her all summer and some school breaks and also in the UK. They asked my son who he wanted to live with but that was only a little bit of the reason I got custody. Also I sent the photos with a message that said look how smart he looks at my wedding. So I told her in the message. Hey guys welcome back it's Ripe again in today's video. A racist employee pulled a taser on me and attacked me and did not realize that I am the owner of the business. Let's dive right into the story. You have probably read countless stories by now about HOAs fighting property owners usually in big or small cities. More often than not you would think that farmers are exempt from HOAs simply given the fact that their work is usually in a more remote place. However, this was not really the case with Emma and Doug Smith though. Emma Smith was pregnant with twins when her husband Doug Smith first laid eyes on the property at the entrance of Ripe Creek Farms, a subdivision 15 minutes southeast of Athens, Georgia. And by the way, Ripe Star, since this story is from outside Reddit, I have changed the names of people and a few of the names of the locations to keep it anonymous. Anyway, the four bedroom, four bathroom Cape Cod style house would be perfect for their expanding family, even better it's set on nearly nine acres of open land. A bountiful backyard harvest had awakened Doug's love for producing fresh healthy food eight years earlier. His one-time hobby had exploded into a profitable business, his so-called Emerald Hill Farm, the organic vegetable operation Duck had run in nearby Madison County, sold its edible wares to high-end restaurants such as Five and Ten, The National and The Expat. Customers exclaimed over its cranberry beans at the Athens farmers market and scooped up produce from the year-round collective harvest multi-farm CSA Duck helped to found. And all this yield from less than 3 acres. I was pretty sure I was maximizing the production on that property, he said. Emma, an ecologist who works for an environmental consulting firm, thought the Ripe Creek property, listed in the $380,000 range, was too expensive for the rundown former horse farm that it was. But Doug's mind kept circling back to its untapped potential. He imagined tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, beans and a dozen other crops laid out in neat rows across the hillside that rose gently behind the house. Before the Smiths could make an offer, the Ripe Creek Farms Homeowner Association board had to approve their plans for a commercial organic farm. Knowing nothing about HOAs, Emma and Doug Smith turned to the internet and learned that HOAs can be the homeowner's best friend. They can also be the spawn of Satan, since the mid-19th century real estate developers have marketed subdivision lots by assuring buyers that they will be surrounded by people like themselves. HOA deed restrictions and covenants have been used to exclude black, Jewish or Asian people from developments depending on the prejudices of the time and region. The Smiths studied Ripe Creek Farms HOA covenants and crafted a detailed letter to the HOA board laying out how an organic farm could operate within the neighborhood rules. As they saw it, their modest farming operation would not disturb the 50 odd homeowners who would be their neighbors on Millstone Circle, which loops around woods and a pond like a lariat dropped by a giant cowhand. Looking back, they should have hired a lawyer. 
The Fair Housing Act of 1968 prohibited outright racial discrimination in home sales, but HOA boards still shut out unwelcome buyers every day. They can also reject current owners' proposed architectural plans, such as adding a new garage or changing paint colors or property uses. They can take action against those who violate a ban on chickens or erect the wrong kind of fence. Ripe Creek Farms was promoted three decades ago as an equestrian community. But the HOA board recently refused to approve a potential buyer with horses. The Smith's proposal reached Sarah Houston, the then HOA president, while she was traveling in Europe. She was thrilled to hear from young people in their 30s who owned a successful farming business. She was delighted that they wanted to take on the blighted property at the subdivision entrance. For most of the 24 years that she has lived at Ripe Creek Farms, it's been an eyesore and the site of several failed agricultural enterprises that had been largely blocked by the HOA board. So in July 2018, Doug and Emma met with the HOA board at Essa Boynton's stately brick home on Millstone Circle, a short walk from the house they hoped to make their own. Ahead of the meeting, Cindy Hickson, the board's vice president, circulated a list of possible conflicts between the farmers' plans and the covenants. The Smiths had anticipated questions about employee parking and bathroom facilities, but there was no way to promise the five voting members that no resident would be offended by deer fencing or hop houses, essentially big greenhouses sheathed in translucent plastic instead of glass. The HOA's lawyer said that nothing in the Smith's proposal violated the covenants. Four members voted in favor of the Smith's proposal, host Asa Boynton voted against it. Or Asa, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that name, but I suppose Asa is correct. So anyway, he did not like the idea of the hoop houses. The meeting ended with an agreement that the board's architectural review committee would need to approve anything the Smith's plan to build on the property. HOAs and organic farms are jostling for position in the ex-urban rings around cities. Nearly 60% of recently built single-family houses and 80% of houses in new subdivisions are governed by HOA restrictions, according to researchers. Many of these are in locations that appeal to commuters and to farmers whose customers will pay a premium for produce with a tiny carbon footprint. In 2016, there were at least 10,000 HOAs in Georgia and 245 certified organic or certified naturally grown farms. Emma and Doug left the July board meeting with lighter hearts. Our hesitations about moving into an HOA were relaxed quite a bit, Doug recalled. At the time, they were super receptive to what we were offering the neighborhood. They soon received a letter, though, confirming the HOA's approval and promising that the HOA attorney would draft a document setting out the terms and conditions agreed upon by all parties for your business to operate within the neighborhood. The note also expressed hope that the couple would become part of the neighborhood. The Smiths moved into their new home on October 1, 2018, when twins Reese and Calvin were nine months old. Doug and Emma had visions of orchard crops, berries and vines in addition to vegetables. They imagined inviting neighbors over to pick excess strawberries and hosting events for kids. They had no idea that before their twin boys turned two, their plants would be shot full of holes like a tin can on a fence post. After closing on their property in September 2018, the Smiths gained a HOA approval to build a deer fence and the $15,000 barrier went up in mid-October. It is made of wire strung on metal poles precisely 10 feet inside the decorative four-board horse fence flanking the entrance to Ripe Creek Farms. The next step would be installing a mix of evergreen and deciduous trees and shrubs in the lane between the fences, which in three to five years would grow to conceal the wire fence. Objections to the fence surfaced during the HOA's annual membership meeting. Resident Cecil Wimps said the board had acted with a liberal interpretation of the covenants. When they approved the Smith's proposal and said that he now found the new deer fence aesthetically offensive. Several others agreed. Other residents said that it was too late to revoke approval now that the Smiths had invested so heavily in the property and that the farm would be an asset to Ripe Creek in the long run. 
New board members insisted that Doug buys larger trees to screen the fence, trees the Smiths simply could not afford and dismissed the hoop house plans as woefully inadequate. I went home and told Emma that we were in a world of trouble, Doug said. Meanwhile, Doug needed a way to start and protect seedlings as the weather turned colder. He submitted plans for a small prefabricated greenhouse which the board approved. But in practice the small structure was not big enough to help what would be acres upon acres of baby plants. Over the next year Doug submitted plans for hoop houses on at least five occasions as membership on the board changed again and again. He received approval once and then Wimps, who built one of the neighborhood's original houses in 1991, filed an emergency motion asking the local superior court to order the Smiths to stop farming immediately. The judge did not completely agree, but he appointed a University of Georgia law professor to oversee the election of a new board. In court, Wimps appeared in understated, well-tailored clothes. His grey moustache matched John Bolton's, he testified confidently that the farm irreparably harms property values in the subdivision and said that the prospect of hoop houses impeded real estate sales. Experienced area realtors Joe Polanski and Laura Layden said that there is no evidence for this and that older homes like the ones for sale in Ripe Creek often move slowly because they don't look as good as newer houses in the same price range. What does lower property values, though the realtors agree, is public controversy. At a second superior court hearing in November 2019, the judge lifted his earlier restraint on hoop house construction, but in December it was clear that three of the five HOA members were dead set against hoop houses. Doug, knowing that the newly constituted board's majority could reject whatever hoop house proposal he makes, has not built anything so far. If he does, Wimps has said he and the new iteration of the HOA are willing to take more legal action. Like so many things, this fight was about appearances. No matter what anyone says about property values, it's all about ugly buildings, said the newly elected board member John Hickson. And yes, hoop houses are ugly. Ugly to some perhaps, but essential for farmers in the northeast of Georgia. It is simply too cold to farm year-round without them. Absent a hoop house, Doug started seeds in newly cultivated soil, tried to protect them with temporary coverings and then watched the seedlings struggle and mostly fail in the field. The Smiths have been kept afloat by Emma's earnings, but Doug's farming income is essential for their family's future. Doug, president of the Athens Farmers Market, ended up skipping the Wednesday market days for the whole 2019 season, which runs from April through December. He did not have enough produce to sell and the impact was like having a rainy market every single week. While their farm founded, the Smiths' legal costs mounted, climbing to $10,000 before the Smiths created an online fundraiser to cover suing the HOA for breach of contract. They have gone to court three times so far and their lawyers and the HOA's counsel are proceeding towards a jury trial in August. We are farming a larger property with less efficiency and producing less product, Doug said in November. If I was a better record keeper, I might have given up at this point. As much as the Smiths want to make their farm work, they want a workable solution to live with their neighbors who have split over the conflict. Doug grew up in Atlanta and Emma in one of its suburbs and they yearned to recapture the feeling they had as kids where streets were shady and quiet and there was no place you couldn't go on a bike. If you hit a rough spot and pitched over the handlebars, a neighbor would come out to check on you. That is what they wanted for their own sons. Roswell Lawrence Jr. also values community and he and his wife bought a home in Ripe Creek three years ago because they wanted a house with a country feel, not too far from shopping and large enough for family gatherings. Although he is a university financial administrator, property values are not his main worry. I am more concerned with the decency that has been lost and how I see neighbors treating each other, said Lawrence. I have heard of 15 and 20 year friendships that have been broken by this singular issue. That concerns me more. People who have lost lifelong friends and no longer feel loved because of this. Me and my family, we are collectively more concerned about this than about our investment here at Ripe Creek Farms. Some women dropped out of the neighborhood's monthly wine and cheese group, close friends stopped speaking and the neighborhood email list turned into a snot slinging insult fest. The board members who approved the farm were denounced as dishonest and accused of selling out the neighborhood. 
The farmer's most vocal adversary was called a bully and a junior Trump who cared only about winning. Faced with this conflict, Doug had to make a big change. He found a path forward and solidarity in the Athens farmers market community, whose veterans have mentored him since he first got serious about organic growing. Another market vendor, Frontfield Farm, is less than 5 miles away from Ripe Creek. Owners Jackie Coburn and Alex Rilko cultivate more than 4 acres of certified organic produce and flowers and they have built several small greenhouses, equipment sheds and buildings for cleaning and cooling produce. They work on four high tunnels hoop houses that are 30 feet wide, 96 feet long and 10 to 12 feet tall. Coburn heard about Doug's troubles just as she and Alex were admitting to themselves that 11 years of early risings, long days and hard physical labor had left them tired and sore. So they struck a deal. Doug would lease Frontfield Farm and they could step back. This is an example of a community pulling together, Coburn said, not tearing itself apart. Now Doug can grow year-round in the hoop houses at Frontfield and use them to start enough seedlings for outdoor plantings in its fields. He still needs hoop houses at Ripe Creek to make that operation profitable, but for now he will plant onions, potatoes and other long-growing crops there. On an unseasonably warm December day during the transition, Doug and Coburn work near the high tunnels, twin boys tumbling about their legs. When the wind kicks up, the front field hoop houses creak and speak. Their white walls rustle like snails, a loose tieback dings like a halyard on a mast. The edge of a doorway flaps like a loose jib. And now the real work begins. And with this we have reached the end of the video, however if you cannot get enough of my content please check out my endless playlist where you can find thousands of hours of content. In addition please don't forget to subscribe to my channel to not miss any of my daily uploads. Thank you so much in advance and I hope to see you again tomorrow.